this is the third part in the talk concerning the rights of carers under the Social Services and Wellbeing Wales Act 2014. This section focuses in particular on the rights of parent carers and young carers. Parent carers are people caring for a disabled child and young carers are people under 18 caring either for a disabled sibling, somebody under 18, or caring for an adult, frequently a parent with disabilities. Much of the earlier talks in parts one and part two apply with equal force to parent carers and young carers. But in the section that follows, we're going to look at additional legal rights that accrue to parent carers and young carers. Section 24 of the Social Services and Wellbeing Act places a legal duty on local authorities to assess when a carer is providing support for an adult or a disabled child who is based in the local authorities area. And as we've seen in earlier sections, the assessment must consider whether the carer has a need for support, what those needs are. And as we've seen also with earlier sections, the assessment must look at the extent that the carer is able and will continue to be able to provide care. The extent to which they're willing and will continue to be willing to provide care. And I think most importantly, in relation to parent carers, there's an assumption in section 21, subsection, subsection seven of the act, that a disabled child is assumed to have a need for care in addition to, or instead of the care and support that the child's family provide. Now that's a unique provision in the Welsh law. It doesn't exist in the English law. And I really can't overestimate the importance of that factor. It's not a question if you have a disabled child of convincing the local authority that you need additional support. It's a question of the local authority demonstrating that you don't need extra support. The presumption is, the onus is that you have a need and therefore it is for the local authority to establish that such a need doesn't exist if, if they wish so to do. Now, as with the previous sections, I'm going to cite English Ombudsman's reports. English and Welsh law, the Care Act in England and the Social Services and Wellbeing Act in Wales are extremely similar. There are small differences, but in all essential elements, they are the same and therefore English Ombudsman's cases read across into the Welsh context. As I've already noted in earlier sections, the English Ombudsman, the local government Ombudsman, publishes all of their reports online. It's a very rich source of material. Unfortunately, the Public Services Ombudsman in Wales doesn't publish um, their reports or only publishes a few. And so we have to look at the English reports for the fine detail of how the law should be interpreted. And we start with a 2016 English Ombudsman's report that I think is highly revealing of the obligations that local authorities owe to parent carers. It concerns a single mother with two children one of whom had significant dis disabilities and was in need of constant supervision. Now the council advised her that it expected parents to organize their work responsibilities around the needs of their children, that it was not the responsibility of the local authority to provide direct payments solely to enable parents to work. Well, with the greatest respect, that completely misstates the law. As we've seen, there is a responsibility on local authorities to provide support to enable carers of any age to remain in work or to return to work. And in Wales, particularly, there's a presumption 
that parents of disabled children need additional support over and above which that which the family can provide. Nevertheless, the local authority had that policy, but it stated that she could use her respite care breaks. She had respite care breaks every fortnight. She could, instead of using them every fortnight, she could store them up and then use them in the summer holidays to enable her to continue to work. But that of course meant that she wouldn't have regular breaks throughout the rest of the year. She held that to be maladministration, to be unlawful. And as he said, and I think it's fairly self-evident that the council had simply failed to understand the law. As he said, the child's assessment and the carer's assessment should feed into each other. The council knew the son needed constant supervision. And the council also knew that the mother was in full-time work and the nature of her job meant that she couldn't make a request or pursue flexible working. These were key factors, but neither the son's assessment nor the care's assessment properly considered these issues. As the ombudsman said, and as we've just noted, government guidance, indeed the law in both nations, clearly states that authorities shouldn't assume a carer is happy to continue in their caring role. Councils in both nations are required to consider whether a carer wishes to work or to continue to work, which of course she did. But there was nothing in the assessments undertaken by the council to show that they had properly considered the impact on her if she didn't receive support during the school holidays. So I think that's a, a good illustration of the Ombudsman coming at this from a straightforward perspective of the law. Clearly councils have got some sort of cultural um, policy background where they feel that they can have these policies, but those policies are in clear conflict with the law. A 2007 report, this is a Welsh Government Ombudsman's report, makes a similar point. This was a parent at a university and he needed uh, direct payments to enable him to buy respite care for his son who had autism so that he, the, the, the father, could pursue university studies. Obviously had lectures at different times on different days. And so he needed the flexibility of direct payments to secure respite care to enable him to stay in university. The council wasn't prepared to do this um, and they, they made I think two significant legal errors. First of all they said that parent carers had to give reasons if they wanted direct payments in lieu of services. Well that's simply untrue. Once you have been held to have an eligible need then you can insist on having a direct payment and as uh, and we showed that in the the previous part two of this talk it's not for anyone who is eligible to have to produce grounds as to why they want direct payments rather than the provision of services the law creates a presumption that they can ask for direct payments demand direct payments without having to give reasons but in any event, the council said that it wasn't going to make a direct payment in that case because it couldn't pay uh, direct payments for childcare as childcare was the responsibility of the parents, whether or not the children have a disability. And again, that's a completely um, straightforward misunderstanding of the law. Parents of disabled children have a right to support they have a right to remain in work. It's a long established right. It existed prior to the Social Services and Wellbeing Act. And for some reason, this was a local authority that had a policy in clear conflict with the, the statutory obligations. The Ombudsman held that, that there's an obligation on local authorities to ensure that parents are not disadvantaged in pursuit of education and training any more than other parents, i.e. parents who don't have a disabled child. Young carers. Young carers have specific rights under the legislation. 
but in some respects, the way those rights are addressed are materially different. So section 42 of the Social Services and Wellbeing Act places a duty on local authorities to assess and meet the needs of young carers, although in the Welsh legislation they're referred to as child carers. And that duty applies to uh, child carers, young carers, if they're based within the local authority area. And they meet the standard eligibility criteria, we, which we looked at in earlier section. In general, however, the purpose of the legislation is different with young carers. Where a young carer is held to be el eligible because they are, their caring is having a significant impact on their well-being, then the purpose of the local authority intervention is not to sustain that caring role. It is effectively to, to stop that caring. As the legislation makes quite clear, young carers should not have to carry out significant caring roles or sometimes referred to as inappropriate caring roles, be that for a sibling or a parent. The idea is that the local authority address the needs of the young carer by augmenting or providing additional support to the disabled sibling or to the parent with impairments so that the young carer stops providing that care and can continue to live um, or to enjoy their childhood. You only get one crack at childhood and uh, if a child has inappropriate caring uh, roles then the local authority should address that by uh, removing those roles. And the assessment process with young carers follows very similar route to that for any other carers, that they should um, assess the outcomes, the aspirations, what it is that the young carer wants to achieve. And in so doing, they should pay particular regard to the development, developmental needs of the child. And we're there talking not only about physical development, but emotional development and of course, educational development. And I think it's an important point that with all assessments, they should be <coughs> proportionate. And it will on occasions be very clear that the local authority should adopt a nuanced approach to assessing the needs of disabled ch child and the young carer that might be caring for that child because uh, they don't want to disrupt the whole family situation. But when we talk about proportionality, we're talking about the depth and the scope of the assessment, not, of course, whether an assessment is undertaken at all. There's a legal duty to undertake these assessments. The proportionality goes to the way those assessments are undertaken. There's been very little case law on uh, young carers, but there is an English case that reads across, I think, to the Welsh context. It's a fairly um, strange case, uh, but it's perhaps worth uh, reciting it briefly, although hopefully uh, a local authority in Wales wouldn't adopt such an inappropriate response as Islington did in this case. It concerned a mother who was deaf and she needed somebody to translate into sign language um, for her and she required one of her children to do that and the local authority took the view and it may have been correct that that was highly inappropriate that the mother shouldn't have been placing these obligations on the child and that she was in a way showing poor parenting skills, I suppose. That's how they would put it. Uh, the local authority accepted that the older daughter had caring responsibilities beyond what were appropriate, 
but they said that this is due to the mother's inadequate parenting. And so uh, somewhat curiously, they refused to undertake a young carer's assessment. And I don't think it takes a great mind to point out that that must be wrong. And I don't think it comes as a great surprise to find that the court held that that was unlawful. It was simply illogical. Yes, uh, the mother may have been acting unreasonably and she may have been making inappropriate demands upon her daughter, but the daughter was catering for the mother's disability related needs, her deafness, and therefore the local authority was under a duty to undertake a young carer's assessment. Having done that, of course, it was still open for the local authority to take any appropriate action it thought, but it couldn't use the mother's perceived unreasonable behaviour as a way of avoiding its statutory duty to undertake a young carer's assessment. 